I'm Mike Peters, and this is China Daily's Big Talk. I'm here today with Brian Linden, who is a longtime fan of China and the Chinese culture, who has opened a uh, institution now called the Linden Center in a bi-style courtyard, courtyard yeah. manor house, old wonderful manor house in Yunnan <laughs> province. Um, he has won the uh, Chinese government's Friendship Award, and more awards for the hotel than I can count. Yeah. So, Brian, welcome to China Daily's Thank Big you. Talk. It's always an honor to come here. Thank you. We've had you here before and always glad to see you too. Um, it's a little complicated explaining the Linden Center. Can you give us kind of a snapshot of what the Linden Center is? You know, even for us, it's sometimes hard to articulate exactly what we are. What we are. All I can say is that most, the project is really driven by this passion for China's culture and some way to preserve, you know, some of the culture that sometimes appears difficult to, to touch here in China. Okay. Um, in the big cities with the developments and everything, sometimes we're not able to see some of this 5,000-year-old history and traditions. So the center was really established to be a platform to share those traditions with visitors. So in a way, we have to have a hotel, well, we have to have a hotel component. We want to be a social enterprise. We did not want to be an NGO. So we wanted to come in and preserve and work with communities, but also be self-sufficient. And so in a way, you could say we're kind of a social entrepreneurial hotel. OK. And I've heard you describe it as um, cultural heritage on the ground. Yes. But, but can you talk a little bit about what somebody who comes to the center will experience? Well, I think what we've tried to do is we've taken a, a national relic um, and carefully restored it and did not necessarily focus on luxury, you know, over-the-top luxury to attract people. What we tried to do is let the traditional kind of elegance, the timeless elegance of this structure and what it represents in terms of Chinese, originally Chinese history and traditions, let that seduce the visitor. So really what we've tried to do is, is restore this compound, not adding gimmicks, not trying to alter it in any way, just trying to let it speak directly to our guests. We, the hotel itself, um, we supplement it by really involving the community. So we have, currently we have three sites, and we soon will have three more. But each of those sites has really, for example, our 16-room guest house, the first one, has 60 staff. And what we're trying to do is not only... 60, 60 staff for 16 rooms. Yes. Okay. <laughs> and most of them are local staff, almost all of them. And what we're trying to do is provide a community model that will allow people, the locals, to feel that not only are we coming in and restoring one of their treasures, but we're allowing them to be a part of that story. And we're allowing them to take pride in this project. Unfortunately, many Chinese tourism, you know, developments or models focus too much, I believe, on just the hardware. And I believe that what China needs in, as it develops, further develops, is a focus on some of the software, some of the spirit, mm -hmm. some of the soul, why we travel, why the community surrounding the, the hotel is important. We believe that the center is not restricted by its front door. The village has become part of the center. And in that regard, we feel very, very proud and our guests have an experience that really is unprecedented in China. So what does that mean very specifically as what am, what am I going to see and do when I come to the Linden Center? Well, we, we, try to, we try to structure some activities. So every day we offer free tours, going into private homes. Because we're a part of the community, you know, uh, my, t my team, we're involved in all the activities of that community of Shijo. So that means that when there's a funeral, when there's a wedding, when there are special you know, temple ceremonies, mm. we are there. I'm there anyways. I have to go. I want to go. And because of that, our, staff, our team goes, our guests go. So it's very common for our guests to come and suddenly find out they're going to a wedding or carrying one of the local gods on a sedan chair to a, to a different temple. Um, these kind of activities would be very staged 
were it not for our in, you know, investment in the community and for the respect we have gained. They call me the Tsunjang in Shizhou. And I think that that is a sign of respect mainly because they realize that we're not there to take. What we're trying to do is praise and also share with them. So I think that that model, this model is a much softer form of tourism and it is a form of tourism that is much more sustainable for the local cultures. They're proud of who they are now and they don't view solely development or tourism development as a way to exploit kind of this, this growth in tourism in China, okay. but ways to ensure that future generations will also be able to see and enjoy these traditions. So I'm really proud of that, and that's what we wanted to instill. And, you know, we've been embraced by the media, by the government, by guests, and um, importantly by the government, because what I think it shows is that heritage preservation is something that the government also is very concerned about. Mm -hmm. And they view us as a very nice platform to okay. go in and do projects and our future projects for them. I wanted to ask you a little bit more about that, that cooperation that you have with the government because, one, I think for a lot of people it's kind of startling that an American is doing what you're doing in a national heritage site. Um, but also, would you talk a little bit about why the, the local government, the provincial government, has been a more successful partner for what you want to do than bringing in some of the kind of investors that are very eager to have a piece of this big China market? I believe that the government is doing both, so that th while they're focusing on preservation and encouraging us to play a role, I believe that there are, there are these larger developments that are occurring in many of these locations. I understand why the, I understand the government has to keep a balance. Um, what I do believe that in the past is that there, was, there were fewer projects like ours being supported. Now that the government has come in and in many ways funded our growth, supported our growth, I think it really demonstrates that China's really looking and kind of trying to evaluate the role that their traditional culture should play in the future growth of the country. We love China. I love China. My whole life, the joy, the, um, the opportunities in my life have come because of China. And everything we do is to show respect to China and show respect to this traditional culture. We have never tried to take advantage in any way of coming in here as a business person and maybe just trying to take. What we have done instead is really come here and just try to share a little bit of our experiences from abroad and say that maybe there are some things that China should be aware of or careful, be a little more careful. I've traveled to over 100 countries. Um, I've worked on projects around the world. I believe that China's culture represents a treasure for all of mankind. And I am willing to come in here and remind my Chinese friends that um, this is something that maybe we should be paying a little more attention to. I had the opportunity to hear your talk last night, and you made an interesting comparison to France. Yes. That France was potentially an interesting model for what China could do for yes. culture. Yes. Can you talk a little bit about that? Well, I believe that France, um, after World War II, well, even before, I mean, France was one of the first countries to offer two, you know, two-week vacations to all, to, all their, to all their workers, you know, in the 1930s. Then you see France after World War II coming in, and since their industrial kind of capacity was destroyed during the war, they, start, they relied predominantly on, on tourism and with the Marshall Plan coming in, and I feel that after 1940, after the influx of Americans coming in in the 40s and early 50s, I think France, France realized the importance that their culture had as a way of attracting people to, to France. I mean, it's one of the most visited countries in the world, I think, number one. Some of them have 90 million visitors or whatever a year. So what I think that France did, and well, I know in 1959 with their first Minister of Culture, which is really interesting that it's really the first country to ever develop a, minist a ministry of culture. And I think that shows the importance that France placed on, on its culture and its traditions. And I think because China has it as well, the ministry, they're called Ministry of Culture, I think that what we should do is empower it a little more now 
um, in China, that, 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 that they should be focusing and have a little more influence on decisions. No longer should, in, especially in areas that have not necessarily been developed, maybe we should be focusing more a little bit on preservation and preserving this, you know, and the conservation of China's traditions. And I think that what I would like to see is with the Cultural Bureau and everything is having a little more power to influence some of the decisions that are being made in the rural areas. I think that is happening slowly but surely. And is that about like enforcement? Yeah, it's enforcement. I think, China, you know, at the national level, we have the division, 2002, the division between, you know, cultural, what would you say, Wenhua Changye and Wenhua Shiye. So I think Wenhua Shiye needs enforcement. China knows this and recognizes this and has tried to implement this. But what happens, I think, that sometimes in the, in the rural areas is, unfortunately, it's hard to always enforce it. So what we're trying to do is go into the rural areas and not enforce it from necessarily above or through legal reasons, but force it by ex enforce it by example and show them that there are ways that the, the culture can be, can be saved and preserved, but also can make money and, and help a community. It doesn't necessarily mean exploitation of business opportunities, but this can combine both community you know, kind of outreach, a plus, plus um, business practices. You know, maybe I'm not going to have two Land Rovers or even one, but at the same time, I do believe what we're leaving China for future generations and what we've shown and demonstrated provides me with much more self-esteem than, um, than any type of material, you know, um, possession. I heard you talk about the interactions that you have with the local community and, and uh, you said that the, the the government sponsors when you were developing the first building mm -hmm. were very anxious for you to bring in top architects and top right. builders from Chengdu and other places right. yeah. and you resisted that. Yeah, I wanted to show, I wanted to again demonstrate. I understand why the government probably, why they wanted that. It's um, when you're in a rural area the appeal of bringing in someone from Tsinghua or Tongji is very, very strong, very great. I can understand that. But at the same time, I wanted to remind them that they had skills in their backyard, in their neighborhood. And our, the architect that we chose on the restoration of our first site, which, is the, which really was one of the first national relics uh, given access, you know, to, I mean, allowing a foreigner to take access of it. We used a Yi woman a Yi ethnic woman from the region to do the project. We didn't feel we needed to bring in gimmicks. I didn't need to bring somebody who was very well versed in Mediterranean style, you know, hotel design. What I wanted to do was preserve and let the original, let the local culture speak via the hardware. We would, we would supplement it with the software, but the hardware I find too often in China, the, the res restoration, of so many structures or the building of this so-called um, hotel culture in China relies so often on just luxury and what I would say gimmicks, things that we don't really need to make our travel experience much, doesn't add much to our value. Like the TV over the bathtub. The TV over the bathtubs and these kind of things. The, um, what do you say, the vanishing pools or what is horizon pools? You know, these swimming infinity pools, pools yeah. infinity pools and things where most people will never use them, but they believe it provides face because they go in there and they think, wow, this is cool. So what I'm worried is that in many ways, China, so many of these places that are being developed were not blank slates. They had a very strong, they all had strong cultures, very proud cultures. And I believe that travel should be sensitive to some of the local needs and, and cultures and not just come in and cater to a, a fad, a nouveau riche, a, a traveler who only can um, kind of justify or, or judge an experience based on the hardware and whether or not they had a good selection of French wines, you know, or something when they're traveling to rural Yunnan, which to me does not seem that important. Yeah. 
obviously the Linden Center has attracted a lot of high-profile visitors. Mm -hmm. uh, the U.S. ambassador comes there, Chinese movie stars come there, um, the major news agencies come there. There's an expense to doing something like what you're doing. Everybody can't come there. Right. Is it a challenge to translate what you're doing for that kind of audience that can come there and spread that awareness of what travel can be sure. to people that don't? Uh, yes, it's a, it was a challenge. And when we first started our, the Linden Center, we found that we were catering mainly to a slightly more affluent crowd. We were influencing them. We felt that many people were having a different type of China experience. And this was allowing them to have a little more empathetic view, I believe. They, they would go, some people would leave with tears in their eyes. Mm -hmm. It was like their first time they said they understand why I love China, why I was doing this. Because they were connecting with real people real and people. not getting their picture taken in front of the Great Wall. Exactly. But what we wanted to do is I wanted to also influence young people. So our second site we designed to be an education center. And that would appeal to younger people, less expensive. So right now we work with President Obama's girls school. How I wanted, I wanted to target the best and the brightest, mainly because I feel that Sidwell friends, many of the people who will come on this program will be future leaders in the U.S. And I believe that if they come to China and have an experience with us, that the type of experience I know our community can provide to them for, for four or five months, that they um, will return, or all their lives, they will have a different feeling about China. And so it was a very conscious effort on our part to try to reach out as well to start influencing young people, especially those who will maybe influence the world in some way. So our second partner school is Shanghai American School, mm -hmm. in, and they one of the oldest international schools in China. And they come from four to five one-month programs a year. So again, we're hoping... What do they do? Sidwell Friends, the former, they do their whole semester program, just as if they were back home, but with a much more China focus. Okay. So what they'll do is AP programs, and it will include environmental science, but they'll focus on China. So they'll, they'll go up into the mountains and set up video traps to track wildlife, work different things, you know, do some really incredible mm. programs. Every one of the students will do an internship. So they'll work with one of the local craftspeople. Or we even had one young boy who became a horse cart driver there. In Shizhou, we still have horse carts. There are taxis. And he became, he learned exactly how to, he learned that trade. Huh. So it was so, obviously so cute to go into Shizhou and see this kind of tall, handsome 18-year-old boy leading leading the horses and taking the locals out to their villages. Mm. So what I'm hoping is that people to people, you know, interaction, um, even at the adult level or even at the youth level, will help to bridge some of the challenges that maybe China and the West will face. Just remind each other that there's a lot of friendship. There are people like you and you and me who really love China. We're here for the right reasons. We're friends of China. And I will not do anything that in any way reflects negatively on China. And what we're trying to do, I think we need that balance. We see enough sometimes in the media or different things, views of China that I feel sometimes positively or negatively I don't always support. And if others, if we could get a more balanced view and allow more people to see life in the villages, the interaction with the people, um, the support that I mentioned that the government provides us, it's just incredible. And um, I'd like to, sh our, our center is there to share that with the world. Very good. When you came to China, 1983, mm -hmm. 1984, that was not something that had been on your Mm -mm. on your radar for a long time. You, no. you say you kind of came to China by accident. Accident. How did that happen? You know, my, uh, my background is such that I did not have many opportunities <clears throat> in the States. Uh, my father, really, we didn't realize, was illiterate. And my mother, 
we don't know if she finished high school. I, she was, she's an incredibly brilliant and, and emotional and caring woman. But it meant that really I had very little, we didn't know what to do necessarily. They didn't know what to provide us in terms of saying, Brian, go to university. They, they loved us. And really all they could tell us was go out and pursue your dream. Mm. So I started, um, I was working very early, 15, 16 years old, and working 30 to 40, 40, 50 hours a week. And in 1983, I found, I saw an opportunity to come to China purely by accident. I was cleaning carpets in a University of Chicago professor's home. Huh. And he had just come back from China. And as I said, 83. 83. And he was putting a flag on the map to show that he had just returned from China. He had flags on all the countries he had visited. This was one of his most proud kind of moments. He was up there. China was, you know, off limits until just those early years. You Most know, people didn't go there. Yeah. No. So he saw me, and it was kind of interesting. I think he came back from China, and he saw me working hard, you know, carrying this 50-kilogram, you know, 100-pound machine. And he says, is this what you want to do with your life? You know, and I thought it was a little bit condescending, <laughs> but at the same time, it was also eye-opening. And he said, you know, maybe if you feel that there, the opportunities, you know, in Chicago or in the States at the time were not meeting, you know, were not fulfilling your needs, maybe you should look abroad. And he felt very, very positive about his experience in China. So the next day, out of curiosity, I went to the international office of the night school I was attending because I was working full time. I was cleaning carpets. And um, I saw an opportunity to come to China. China had just opened up. The Ministry of Education was after offering independent um, student scholarships. And I applied, and somehow I got the scholarship. I was not the most qualified student. I probably did not have the best background. But what I did have was a very kind of proletariat, in a way, background. I had a working class background. I had a background that relied on passion and hard work to get to where I was. And I think that that was attractive to China in the 80s. You stood out a little bit from the Ivy League applicants, Ivy League probably. applicants. And I arrived in China in 1984 on my birthday, August 28th. And August 30th, I was suddenly acting in a movie. I was playing the first <laughs> leading, leading role, leading actor since 1949 in a, in a locally produced movie. So life changed so quickly for so me. So did somebody spot you with this hair? Yeah, somebody I think just spotted me. I would, there weren't many foreigners back then. So it was like, there's a foreigner, he's our actor. And um, so even though I spoke absolutely no Chinese, I decided to, obviously I was honored. And I tried my best and the movie was okay. <laughs> and. Um, but it was called He Came it. From Across the Pacific. <laughs> so, um, and then, um, then I ended up moving on to CBS News after speaking to them be, during the filming. And, uh, you know, my life changed forever. So for many ways, China has been my life's only mentor. It's been my life's only, only you know, teacher. And the pre-1984 Brian, very few people wanted. You know, the after 1984, suddenly I found many people wanted a piece of. Mm -hmm. And they wanted a piece of it not because of my carpet cleaning prowess, but because of my experiences in China. So everything since in 1984 has been a reflection of a, a thanks and a love for China. It's almost like China, you know, when you have a mentor, you love, you love that mentor. And when my mentor started to rely increasingly on brand names and on material goods to for a self for self esteem, I I felt that you somehow mean China. yeah well I mean the idea of so much of the a face increasingly in China has become associated with synonymous with brand names, and what I felt that in some way we were forgetting some of the beauty and some of the wisdom of China's tradition. And I wanted to go, and the center is our effort to rekindle that 
to develop platforms in rural China that will allow people to touch that beautiful, the local people, the traditions of gregariousness and everything, but at the same, same time supplement it with some really intellectually stimulating kind of workshops and interactions, um, everything from music to writer's workshops to photography to culinary. And those are, I find that people want that. People want to touch more of China. It's just that so often it's been limited to the five-star hotels here. And I find that so much of my life in the big cities gravitates, you know, I gravitate from Starbucks to, to City Shop to, you know, whatever. And that to me is not, that's not the only China. There's a China that is so beautiful and, and incredibly seductive that is out there. One last thing. Okay. You have talked about how two of your biggest assets for yourself, you think, are passion and humility. Mm -hmm. Is humility hard to come by for foreigners? And how has that worked for you? This is an, a, you know, the humility is so important. And I don't want to criticize and I don't want to be critical of many Westerners because many Westerners come to China for the right reasons. But there are a lot of Westerners as well who have been sent here and, and are, you know, for, for work reasons or whatever. Many of them may spend their whole lives here and very, learn very little Chinese or care too much about their environment. Um, my humility has come mainly because I came to China because in a way I, I, it, it, I didn't have anywhere, I didn't have any, anywhere to go. I didn't have any, you know, it gave me the only opportunity in life. And everything since then, I have realized how much it has provided me, injected the self-confidence, injected the support. It would have been very easy to manipulate that and take advantage and very early get involved in business or something, which I solely would have used to take, take out of China to really, to more or less just exploit business opportunities. After I left Stanford, I, I had opportunities to come back to China to work with corporations and things. It just didn't seem to resonate with me. In a way, I wanted some way, a better way, to interact and express my, my passion for this culture. So in 2004, Jeannie, my wife and I, and our two boys, five and eight, you know, we sold our home in America. We gave up our careers. We came to China for two years to look for our first site. So I hope that China always remembers that this demonstrates a passion and a, and a love for China that um, goes far beyond a business decision. Um, this was very risky. It risked my whole life savings, everything. And um, I think that what I would like to see is more Westerners, more outsiders, more foreigners coming here with dreams as well. Not dreams of what we can take from China, but dreams of what we can maybe contribute. And the humility I have is that China will always be my life's only mentor. And I will do whatever I can to honor that mentor throughout my life. And I'm still just honored to be here and tickled to, to be doing what I'm doing with my life. You still feel like a guest here? I, all, I, I feel China has embraced me and such that I feel like it's my family, mm. but I also never abuse that. And I always feel that China, I feel like an honored guest here. And I think too often we as Westerners get treated with much more respect than necessarily we deserve or is commensurate with our, our skill sets. And I think that we need more people here who recognize that and don't abuse it and try to maybe go beyond and do something good for the communities here rather than just come here and you know, go from Western restaurant to Western restaurant to shopping center to whatever. Sure. Brian, thank you very much thank for you, being Mike. with us today. Thank you for hosting me. Absolutely. Thank you. This has been Big Talk with China Daily. I'm Mike Peters.